Thanks, um, Susie, for doing this. Hey, man, I was I I listen to this sometimes, so I'm fun to be doing one. There was a great one of these with um, um, what's his name was doing Star Wars did Terry Gilliam, but it was like there was like two of them or something. But I remember yeah. I listened to the second one first, and then I went back and tried to find the first one. <laughs> Have you listened to this? Because it's a crazy freeform conversation. I mean, yeah. the ones I've listened to, like, go wherever the heck okay. they go, which is fun. I'm Nick Dawson, the editor in chief of Talk House Film, and the voices you just heard belong to JC Chandor and Josh Mond who are in conversation today in this latest episode of the Talk House Film Podcast. Chandor and Mont have been friends since 2011, in their alphabetically proximate films Margin Call and Martha Marcy May Marlene played the festival circuit together. The latter film, directed by Sean Durkin, was the second feature put out by the Borderline Films Collective comprised of Mond, Durkin and Antonio Campos, and built on the early success of Campos' After School. All Borderline movies are produced by the two who are not directing, and as a result, Mond, who was the last of the trio to make his directorial debut, was up until now known solely as a producer. That all changes with James White, Mond's visceral and moving semi-autobiographical drama about a young man struggling with his demons as he processes the death of his father and his mother's ongoing battle with cancer. Mond's direction is striking and assured, and he elicits excellent performances from Christopher Abbott and Cynthia Nixon as the title character and his mother, respectively. The intimate and personal nature of James White is reflected in the conversation between Mond and Chandor, which is as much about Mond's journey as a filmmaker and as a person as it is about the specifics of his new movie. But along the way, you'll also learn about his aborted first feature, a sex comedy that was to star Jonah Hill, which of his collaborators had a full beard at 13, and how the Jinx, Andrew Jarecki's sensational doc miniseries about Robert Durst, threw a wrench into James White's editing process. Were you scared going into this? I mean, you've been on tons of movie sets in your life, mm. and you went to film school with, with your whole team, right. that you've gone and made movies, and so you, you know the beginning and the middle of the end of the process. Right. But narratively... Did you sleep well the night before you started shooting? Surprisingly, I did sleep well. Like I was always afraid that I wasn't going to be able to sleep, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but I did sleep well, um, and I got up the next morning, and it felt like I was. I played soccer growing up, and it felt like I was going to a game. Yeah. You know? I think I was terrified, you know, every day uh, while writing it and in prep. You know, I was excited, but I was also terrified, and I think that was good. But so once you started shooting. Or that first day, it felt like the nerves and like, where are you going to pull it off and all that kind of happened in the prep. And then when you were sitting there ready to go, it was kind of like, whatever happens is going to happen. It was just like, okay, we're going. And like the, mis- the, the mistakes you make while going, you just got to keep going. Yeah. You know, and, and the cool thing was is that I had like the practice. Yeah. I got to know my DP, like everybody on the movie, I got to know, I got to connect with. You know, it was like because of the context of the film, it was like I shared yeah. everything with them like I would with people that I wanted to become close with because I want to know about them and let them feel comfortable. So I kind of felt safe to be vulnerable with all these people for the, as much as you possibly could. Yeah. I mean, I was intimidated. How like, many days was it? Like 18, 18 in New York. In yeah, New York. And four in Mexico. Great. But it was, yeah, it was like playing with a team. You know, you, I got to cast my team and I got to play with them some and... Some of them were like more experienced than me. Yeah. So it was a lot of catch. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Had you written a full script before any other story or was this your first mm, whale at it? No, Tony and I, I had written a script in high school with two other friends and Antonio, when I started working with Tony and Sean, I gave the script to Tone and we when started, was that? So how long ago was that? That was when I, I wrote it when I was in high school. So I was like 17 with two other guys. And then you I, wrote this? When no, you were, no, 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 no. Oh, I you wrote an, that other another script. script. Right. It was called Laid. A Amazing. comedy so raw you'll need protection. <laughs> 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 and then, so when I first... You got met, the marketing angle all oh, worked dude, out Oh, dude, it already. was the, 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 the cover was a, a condom. Condom container. Yeah, no, was, but, and, but we had the condom come out of the wrapper and the wrapper was orange and we had this whole plan with Trojan and... We went the distance when I brought it to Tony and to Sean. We, it was the first project we worked on. 
Jonah Hill was attached or it was like it was first movie. Like we went through the whole process. When so wait a second. There you had a script that you had written in high school. You then go to NYU. You meet those guys, and so that stays in a drawer. And then, like year three or year one, well, you well, meet let's, those guys. So I'll, I'll base. So in high school, I wrote the script with two other guys, like junior year of high school. I transferred in, uh, as did Sean, to NYU for our junior years of college. Sean and I met the first day, and we decided to work together. With that week, we ran into of your junior year of college. Yeah. So that script's now three and a half years old. Or yeah. Something. And so we run into Antonio on the street, and Antonio's always been since he was 13 years old, he was like a film prodigy, right. you know, one of the presidential scholar. Yeah. And his well, mom's, you know, yeah. big in the business. Yeah. yeah the like, but he was, he was a prodigy yeah. and he was kind of like a superstar at NYU, you know, a quiet superstar. And so when we ran into each other on the street, he had this short film and I had this script and I was like, let me give you this and you give me that. He went back to read the script, and I and now I know this. And I went to watch a short film with Sean, and we both kind of were like, eh, not so good. But we wanted to work together. So for the next year and a half of NYU, I barely went to class, either to Tony. And Tony dropped out and because he had made Buy It Now, which was at Cannes. Right. And so he didn't really, whatever. But we worked day and night on this. And like I, we begged Susan Shopmaker to cast it. I showed up her office for weeks, and like Tony rewrote it for him to direct and we cast the movie in New York and LA. We crewed it with like older experienced people. And then a month, and like we went out and got all the locations, took photos. We did like a marketing plan, made an animation pitch tape based on the Robert Evans pitch tape. You know, and like yeah. we did everything. <laughs> and, then, and then a month before shooting, it fell apart. Right. We didn't have the money and we were all ready to go. And I think that was like one of the most important things that happened to us is Tony's father even said it. He was like, I hope, you know, in, in one way or another, he said, I hope you guys fail. Right. Because, you know, it just doesn't happen. You have perspective. And yeah. he was right. You know, it wasn't the right movie for us to make. Tony and Sean made Buy It Now out of that for no money. And and it, and it brought us closer together that we right. failed together. And to, you know, oftentimes I have one of those that blew up in like the most terrible part of my life. But it in the end it sort of like steers you back towards something i mean or it can't it can send you into the freaking yeah. you know woods and you never come back again but if you really want to be doing it obviously it just acts as a way of steering you back towards something that maybe was meant to be yeah. so you guys um that's hilarious well but i'll tell you one one beautiful thing about it too is that i went off to produce a movie for my mentor who was like a Ra rodriguez style guy and and uh, <clears throat> and Sean and Tony went to make that short film, Buy It Now. I wasn't involved with Buy It Now. And so we were obviously all still friends, and I looked at the treatment or whatever. But when it got into Cannes, which was completely unexpected, I was invited to go. And it was the first thing that Borderline had its name on. The fact that they included me in the experience, I think, says a lot about where you know our, the, their characters. Right. You know what I mean? It was kind of like a... a a weird test of character. And why do you think they did that? I think Antonio and Sean are, are completely, you know, I'm not just saying this. I think they're some of the most generous, empathetic people in, that I know. Right. And, 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 and they knew that we had gone through all this stuff together. Right. You know, and that our plans weren't finished Fulfilled. no but they weren't finished you right. know, we still had a goal and, and and we remember where they i mean i'm assuming you know and when you went with that short do you guys like stay and do they put you guys up or you stay in like some apartment up the hill or something like they put you they put the director up right like all the way out <laughs> um you know, I don't. I, Were you guys like taking shuttles around? I mean, it's a pretty I think intense I, scene. I, we hitch twenty four year old. Like, we hitch twenty. We were twenty two or whatever. We like. were twenty twenty one, twenty two. <laughs> I remember like hitchhiking a... down the down the croissette because it wasn't like you know in the nice part of the croissette. Right. It was like yeah, no, all the exactly. way past. But not yeah. quite to the hotel to cap. But no, 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 no. <laughs> but outside of town. Yeah, no, but it was uh, it was a fun experience. Yeah, it was super cool. And then out of that, you start to like, that's about right for a 21, 22 year old. I mean, on the up and up is a successful short coming yeah, in yeah. as opposed to the idea that you're going to make a, a fully formed, you know, 
uh, movie, right? Um, which is fascinating. So, do you graduate from NYU? I walked, whatever that means. I walked on stage, and do you have a diploma? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I have like one credit maybe left, and I've <laughs> and I and I've spoken to the people at NYU. Like they've been extremely supportive of us. But my problem is, it's not a film credit. Uh, it's like a Science. Well, don't do like a history class or something. It would be good. Yeah, totally. Because it's like <laughs> totally possible right now not having an apartment and like not knowing where I'm living. And oh, yeah, it's like a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks. Totally. So after school, like that is that obviously starts a whole different kind of well, not a whole different, but it takes you to it. Well, he well, he got uh, he applied to the residence program, the Cannes residency program, and he applied twice. And he got in the second time with after school. So how are you guys so good? Talk to me as a total fuck up like I am about the application process and the like structural support that is in place okay. for filmmakers and tapping into it for a minute. Well, I've one, always admired you guys. Well, it's the one way fuck that up you to do. another. So. Right. Yeah. But you obviously hung out with some guys who knew how to fill <laughs> yeah. out half, half the fucking case. <laughs> Did you ever apply to a residency no, program? No, I've never. I applied to uh, the Sundance uh, Producers Lab, um, and I kind of was accepted. But you know, they gave me the, the 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 some a grant, and then they gave me a mentor. But we were shooting like the day after the lab ended, right. and they knew that, and so they were like, "There's no point for you to come. We'll give you the other stuff." But you know. And that was a piece of paper or something online that you literally fill out? Like, how do you actually... F you have to fill out, like, they have, like, a bunch of essay questions, which I'm not really good at. No, this is why I'm asking the I, question. I, it yeah. seems like I'm trying to picture My, oh. you at that point being like, I'm applying... Now, you've obviously seen it work for Antonio, and, like, well, go back to where you were. Uh, you no, 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 because so, a lot of stuff just came up. My mother was an English teacher. Right. I, I was kind of enabled never to really write my essays. <laughs> uh, I've definitely been a fan of the Cliff Notes, you know? <laughs> like, I don't think I read any of the high school books until after high school. Until after high school, which yeah. is the best way to do it. Uh, but, no, Tony, Tony and Sean are both... Ex like they're great students. Yeah, they really are. And and you know, Sean in college really, really, I don't know. He really took full advantage of, of the school. Like right. he really, he, he he really went to class. He really did the work. He, he he absorbed everything, and he really took it for what it was worth. Antonio's always been like, even in high school. We went to high school. I was there for a year and a half. He was in my Latin class. And I just remember him because he had a full beard at 13. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> He's Brazilian and, and Italian. No, I know. So I, I can it, picture it, it now. It's, it's, him. <laughs> and um, he, uh, he was so smart. I would like cheat off him in class and you know, uh, he's going to kill me. I think he had like one of the rolly backpacks, um, but he was, he was, he's a hard worker. Right. He's so he's one of the most well-read and, and, and he's seen the most films out of anybody I know. Um, but so they both had like this really good kind of work ethic in place and, and kind of fell into that really well. Um, I definitely even got help from Sean in high in college with my essays. I never wanted to do them. I'm the type of person that like writes a sentence, erases it, writes it, erases it. And Sean, I think Antonio is both. They both told me to just just say what you're trying to say. Don't say try and say it. You know, right. just say it and, and, and write it all the way through, no matter if it doesn't make sense and it's a piece of shit, you know, and I'm still trying to practice Tell that, me about it. you know, and, 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 and that kind of stuff, they, they were beyond involved in, my, right. in the writing process for me, you know, and, 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 and they, I, they have a little bit, they have more confidence, I guess. Um, I don't know. And more, they have more experience at, at, and, and they've worked really hard. But when it comes to the application process, my mother was still alive. <laughs> So I was definitely like running things by her and getting some help from her with my applications. And was this Mar what movie were you about to be heading into at that point? They I had submitted with another film that Antonio didn't make uh, for the first go around, but for the second time, I submitted with Martha. Right. Yeah, and and and, and Tony Sean had just done the the director's lab or was doing the director's lab, and uh, and so. But Antonio the, movie has already come out at that point, correct? After, yeah. After school premiered, uh, was that what year was that? Nine. Two thousand seven. We shot it. Whole. Oh, we shot it in seven. So it would have been there shooting. at like eight or nine. Two thousand eight. 
Eight. And then, you know, it was a really tough year for film. In yeah. And uh, it was like everything was falling apart. And everything. Like... And, and we had to wait. Like even it went to Cannes, uh, New York Film Festival, Berlin, even South by and Gotham nominations, Spirit Award nominations. And we were having so much difficulty selling the film. Um, but yeah, so we did we did uh, after school. And that, that was, you know, through the residency program at Cannes. And Tony had done a short film while, like, just before going to the program that played official competition uh, right before we went into production. Wow. So Sorry. let's come back here. So you're now, <laughs> when did your mom pass away? 2011, uh, March, March 11th. Wait, no, I'm, yeah. So pass? right after the Sundance of Martha Marcy. Yeah. Good God. I yeah. had no idea. Yeah. So things are like taking off in your life. You're signing like overhead deals and you're right. selling right. Um, uh, movies and you're like living the 10 year dream. Right. And your mom's illness, like it had been a year. I mean, how long was the entire process? Uh, she, I guess she was diagnosed right um before going into production on after school so, so a long battle yeah so it was like we had made four years and four movies in four years right um and it progressively got worse so your life professional life is fucking taking off yeah, and her health of. is like almost in exact opposite yeah deteriorating yeah i remember like she she got to come to can once and she came with after school and she was uh taking steroids i don't know if you know much i about do that. my i have a niece who's a four-year-old dealing with cancer right now and the I'm steroids sorry. are like just like they 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 yeah i don't know how it is it's terrible when she started taking them we had to go to she encouraged my mother encouraged us to go to a support group me and my right. aunt so we went to one with her and they were like all these telling us what we're about to experience yeah and, it was crazy, and she, and thank God she got to come to Cannes. Right. Like she got to be like, oh my God, this isn't just like a pipe dream. Right. Like, you know, like, because there was definitely a point in my life my mother was like worried that I was never going to leave the house. Right. No, you right. know, that like she was the only one that believed in, in, right. in me, and, and you know, like our parents were the only ones that believed in us. Um, but then when Martha happened, she... I gave her two, I had Sean and Tony both made DVDs of their films to bring to my mom to watch. And so she was struggling during Sundance and, um, you know, we sold the Fox, which was surreal. And she, she knew she got to know about it. And, uh, I came back from Sundance and some, my sister was protecting me while we were there from like all the shit that was going on. I mean, there were right. conversations about hospice. She wasn't speaking and there was, it was, it was bad. And thank God for my sister. Um, but when I got back, it was pretty hev heavy. And then Fox called us and was like, we want you to come to L.A. and meet everybody and talk about some other projects. And so I had to make a decision. And my mom said it was okay for me to go. So I went. The last day that I was there, was when I was only there a week, I got a phone call that she was going to pass. And so Sean, Tony, and I all flew back right away. And they were, you know, again, another testament to them is like, we went straight from the airport to her house and my aunts were there and my sister and family friends and she was uh you know she wasn't speaking and she was just rattling at the breath and and they were there for it you know so she get she basically got i got to tell her that you know that time with fox we they were already buying you know yeah. a, a two scripts from or a script from sean i think maybe one from tony so it was like okay things might be changing and yeah and i got to tell her that when did you first uh, think that there might be a, mo a movie that that's something you'd want to look back on? I think, you know, it, it was like we were searching for something to say. And I think, you know, through Antonio and, and Sean, like I was encouraged to work on something else. And, 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 and that kind of led me to my own stuff. I was, I was really pushed to, to really focus on what was going on. And, you know, subconsciously, my parents were both writers, but not professionally. And everything they wrote about was really things they didn't understand that were personal to them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think it's been instilled in me and, you know, and also through my partners. You yeah. Know, and kind of what our tastes are. No, what an amazing support 
I know this is a crass question to be asking right now, but I guess where do you, you're a producer. At that point, you were a producer who was writing something, and a very successful producer was writing something. So how did you find dealing with all the emotional elements that you're trying to get into a story and the fact that you're just writing a movie just like all the other movies you have seen and what so I mean did you think of it as a movie or did you think of it as something you were trying to write I guess I used to carry around a lot of journals right right? and I used to and I was I'm very OCD I'm a lazy OCD (laughs) you know so in my journals I would like I would they sell these like uh in Bedford uh like these colored journals and they're different sizes. There's a small one, there's a medium one, there's a large one. And I would break it up into three different acts. And then I would also, and then write notes in one for that one act and questions and so forth. But then I started having journals, different colored journals for family members and friends and then just constantly writing letters to them. And so it was just this kind of learning by doing and just what I wanted to say. But you got to remember that Antonio and Sean were like bumpers Right. You know, like bowling with bumpers. They they were kind of like keeping me in the lane. The one of the two of the things that stick out the most is that Antonio and I went up to his grandfather's farmhouse where we shot Martha and like no cell phone service, no internet, and he was working on another script and I was working on mine for about a month. And he would he would read every single thing. He would I would turn the computer to him if I couldn't write something, you know, like he was fucking involved and then we would like finish it and then feel good about it and then we'd send it to Sean and then we'd wait for Sean you know and then when Sean came to the states you know I'd have we'd walk through the entire script scene by scene and he'd like half me I'd have to explain everything or justify it or he would tell me his concerns and then we would redo it together you know they really went went full into it i mean it was and then they they cut down the script together for me i mean it was at like 120 and they before shooting they 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 cut it cut 15 pages out of it right what you know they were that involved wow yeah I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody likes writing out of the three of us so much. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a brutal process. Even people who love writing hate writing. I mean, it's just painful. and uh, But it's in all the right ways, I think. So you know Chris. I know Chris, star of your movie. Right. Um, there's certain scenes which obviously are you know very specifically <laughs> referencing. Right. But did you feel like at that point... Um, he was sort of becoming you or do you think you let him become the character like did it become a character at that point well just to back up for a second it's yeah. like when i was working with my dp he he obviously he has a ton of experiences was going way beyond the responsibility of a dp and breaking on <laughs> it's the, the best kind breaking down the script. my first to be on my first movie <laughs> like should have gotten definitely a directing credit on the movie <laughs> but like he broke taught me how to like we broke down the entire movie into beats and then you know really discussed the language and 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 one of the things i, I remember most is 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 him saying to me like you know, you have to you, you have to divorce yourself from this because you're going to have right. to hand it over. So I really understood that once we started working with other people, they had their own fucking connections to it. Right. And so that's why they're hired is they're bringing their perspective. And at that point, even though it wasn't autobiographical, it at that point, the, who you thought the character was, you're now passing it off. Yeah. DP, costume designer, Chris, Cynthia, w- w- Scott, whatever. And with Chris... You know, we we discussed the character as a character, not me. Right. And that was helpful to, like, let it go. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that, let it be what it, what what it, you want, what yeah, it is. It's just, I mean. It was just an, it's an intent. Yeah. Everybody gets to see the intent from the script, and then we start to create together. Right. You know, if it was just me, I would have hired operators, and it wouldn't right. have been good at all. No. You know what I mean? Like No, I, it had to come alive as its own thing, obviously, with the the foundation and the heart of it, it starts in a very specific place, but then it has to become it attracts everyone's. the people. Yeah. The, the, the intent attracts the people. And hopefully, and, and I feel like we got really lucky with everybody involved. And with Chris, it's like, I don't know, you know, because you've worked with Chris and I know you guys yeah. are really close, but he's like fucking Paul Newman. Right. He's like, I mean, it's not bullshit. Like yeah. straight up, like he is, you look at the characters that Newman does like HUD and on paper, it's like, I, you know, that guy's, 
despicable. Right. But that's what he, being human is. Right. You know, as being honest about the shit and about, you know, when we're bad. What's fascinating for me is when you're taking such an intense situation in your own life and then you're sharing it in such a beautiful way, but it's also very public, you know? Yeah. And, and so it's... um. And you're essentially sharing that story and being able to give it over to all those collaborators yeah. is a, it's almost freeing, I would think, well, by be, potentially doing that. Yeah, you know? well, the thing is, is that, like, apparently it's, it's you know, it's, it's quite common, you know, the, the way we look at how we've reacted during these tragedies, you know, and, and, and it's hard to articulate, so you feel very alone in it. But like when you meet somebody who's going through losing somebody or has lost somebody, there's a there's a connection already because yeah. the shit you can't articulate inside of you that's going on that chaos, it's understood between each other. Right. And so with the film, which has been wonderful, and I and I realized actually through my DP while we were making it is that I was desperate to connect. Right. You know, and I think what's cool is that. You're not alone in these, in these, in this guilt and the shame and, and 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 you know these reactions. You know that this is all normal. I mean, there used to be in the film a line where Chris says to uh, Ron, "It's okay that I want her to pass." Right. You know, I want her to die. Yeah. And he was like, "Yeah, that's normal." Like that's crazy to say that aloud. Right. You know, but there is some truth to that. And I think it's important. I don't know. I, I, for me, like getting it out there is, is important because the, the not feeling alone. I mean, that's why I watch movies. I watch right. Movies. Well, I, I think that's connect. what you guys have done with this is by it's shared in a way that it now helps. I mean, that's the hope, right? It's why you like go through all this ridiculous crap we go through to try to make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that essentially um, it hopefully becomes a shared experience that enriches or, or helps somebody else. Uh, where were you in your life when you started uh, editing? So you want to hear? So you want to hear some drama? <laughs> yeah, I was about to because I'm working through the so, timeline here. <laughs> so we we started shooting December thirteenth, uh, two thousand thirteen, and we finished in January, you know, two thousand fourteen. So my editor, who's a longtime collaborator, is Zach Stewart Ponte. He did Martha. I tried to hire him away from you guys at one point. It's, like, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Zach. Hasn't he been on a documentary? Well, forever? let me let me tell you what okay. happened. So, so fucking, <laughs> so so like you know, Zach and I have been working together for since we were twenty. So like twelve years, right? And we're family. I was like one of the best men at his wedding. Like we're family, and I love the dude. But two days before the movie started, you know, he was like, uh, he had he's like had to do the jinx. Like it was no longer a movie; it turned into a miniseries. And I wrong. I was wrong. I got really upset. <laughs> Because I was like terrified not to be working with him. Right. But he was patient with me to come back and, and apologize for, you know, <laughs> being an asshole. Because uh, I was an asshole. I was so mean. And Because um, anyway, he was on that gig. He, yeah. And he had already right. been on it for three years and he had right. devoted so much. And, you know, and he was proud of it. And, and, and he had to keep going. And, and, and obviously, in retrospect, I completely understand and apologize to him again. <laughs> I'm sorry, Zach. But through that, I so we were shooting. We were looking for a new editor, and we found an editor who was in Europe, and I was really excited about it. And then when I got to Europe, I got the day I got there after shooting in like February, he calls me and he has to drop out. So I'm in Paris for fucking ten days, like moving from hotel to hotel because I'm doing that hotel for a night thing. Whereas, <laughs> and like. I was meeting with editors in France, and I, I wanted to edit it in Paris. I wanted to edit it, like, uh, someplace new where I didn't have right, instructions. Right, away. Yeah. Away. And, and I met a bunch of people who were great people and great editors. It just didn't fit. And so I came back to New York, and we were just searching like mad. And so I, we found an editor through our friends who we, we admired who edited Enemy. Yeah. Uh, Denis Villeneuve's yeah, film. Yeah. And he worked with Danny and Sonder, who do a lot of the music for our films. Uh, but I had to wait two months. So you've got literally the things sitting in the yeah. hard drive and nothing's happened. No, well, we have an assembly. Right, but so I mean... Tony had done an assembly. Uh, you know, uh, we had a guy who was like our assembly editor. Like we had something there. 
I just Good. Was, so you'd gotten to see something. I got to see but I wasn't happy right like I was no, too close like to scary. it it's yeah. like scary like, do you that. watch dailies during the sh- I never rewatch them no. no but you don't watch like assemblies during the movie do you yes I, of scenes of scenes but never the whole movie right. but I like to see scenes so I don't ever watch I just watch like editors selects right and I have like a weird photographic memory so I can remember all my takes which is a really that must bad be. it's bad That's it's very bad, bad. <laughs> I mean not not all it takes not like how many times he walked across do you but sleep if, but if it's i do really well uh, but i can if it's an important scene i'll remember the four takes that i wanted to look at of your take i know i'm dyslexic it's weird that's kind of, that's kind of a <laughs> but it, so a i'll gift. be in an edit room six months later and i'll right. be like i think there's something else here but it allows me to free uh, up because so i don't have to be like re-watching right. all of the dailies because right. i sort of feel like i saw them that's, you know when we shot that's it. crazy and then kind of <laughs> it's not i mean obviously it's not a perfect system and i do go back right but it does allow me to be a little more comfortable because if the editor has put something in there that mm. is that isn't i'll be like that ah, you know and i don't yeah. usually do it right away but it huh. um but i love it edi- i don't like actually editing i can't sit there but i'm like a, I love the process. I well, think it's I, like, I got to learn that. It's well, that's like, what I was about to yeah, say. Because so you, as a producer, it's a very different experience with the editing because you get to come in as a wonderful, like, sort of, you know, helper and like, you know. But yes, like, so I, I still never liked an assembly. Like, I freaked out at every assembly I saw of every movie. Well, like, you should. Like, I mean, Martha and horrific. after school, like, I, but I didn't understand, like, I, the fact, the patience that my partners have have for me and have had for me is right. amazing. Because you thought it was a disaster. I was just like, what the, f-? you know, I didn't understand. Right. And then through after school, I got to see so many cuts, which was wonderful, like, to be part of that experience. Right. So didn't you have the faith that it's going to get better? Yeah, I just, I just remember. didn't, I just didn't know. I didn't, I don't, I don't. But I'll get back to the editing. So we, we met, so we got Matt Hannum and Matt, who did Enemy, he met me in Paris and we started editing in April. And then we did, you know, two and a half months of getting to know each other. And I was, he was like my, th- kind of like my therapist. Yeah. And he got to know me at the most vulnerable place. So he didn't get to see the persona and the facade. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was just like. Especially after waiting that long, you'd yeah. be ready to. Like... Cause, well, at, before that, I had, they, Tony and Sean was like, you need to go in and just sit with the material. Like, just look at it. So they had worked with a co-producer we had to find someone who was a good fit for my insanity. And they found the best guy, this kid, Nick Pesh, whose movie we just finished. We mentored his film. Cool. Um, he, he sat with me and he was wonderful. And we just went through scenes and like edited the movie backwards and forward. You know, we just experimented and just got to know the footage. And so I had done an assembly with him. And then my editor, Matt, had done an assembly on his own. And we met in Paris and showed each other our assemblies. And then through that process, we started from scratch. And then we, we were having a little bit of difficulty finding the language. And a lot of the movie was like, you know, uh, we shot it as w- one long take all the time, you know, uh, one setup really. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had experimented with some stuff and, you know, and then once Tony, he came to Paris, start working with us and he helped us find the anxiety in the film. Just don't work on scene by scene. Just fucking go, like I said before about the essay, you know, write that's right. keep writing, don't go back and forth. And he threw a wrench into it and helped us find the language of just the jump cutting through, yeah. you know? And it was awesome. And, and, and to, to, to feel okay with that. Right. And then Sean came in for a week. And that was like, I think uh, Matt had said, like, Sean, Sean's like the the tailor and Tony's the butcher. Right. You know, and so that was the nice little, it was wonderful. Like I got Mis- the, like, what does Mr. Miyagi do? The trees where you <laughs> cut them really small. Oh, the, uh, the bonsai. bonsai exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so like they, they came in and then, you know, and then we did uh, two and a half to three months in Paris. And, um, and then, you know, I, I did some work in, in upstate New York and Sean and Tony. When you showed it the first time in public, what was your, were you in the room or did you leave? You mean like a, for notes? No. Like when, yeah. oh, at in, Sunday, at like when you had to show the movie. My, bo- my body was, I was sat by myself <laughs> behind everybody. Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and I, my heart was beating. I, my, I couldn't, I felt like I was underwater. And, uh, and what just, theater was it there? And it was a library. Cool. And it worked out. It worked out pretty well. 
It was good. It was a good screening, I think. That yeah. Was, Sundance was a good experience. Even the second screening at the Egyptian was awesome. So it was, yeah, I remember my first screening was like the most horrible thing I've like ever been From through. Margin Call. Yeah. It was Where like, did you screen? In that huge one. You and Eccles. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, 2,000 people or something. And I just, we hadn't shown it really publicly ever before. Right. We, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. And uh, I, we went and cut four minutes out of the movie right after it because I like enough three and a half minutes. Where did you do that? Little tiny, like Bonsai. It was like it was like we never from Sundance to Berlin. Okay. I cut three and a half minutes and it made the movie much better. But it was no one place. It was very Bonsai-ish. But it was just like hanging chads where I. It was when you're in that the feeling you're talking about right. sitting in a room and you're like ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I'm sorry it wasn't more of a conversation. I think it was a very good conversation. Yeah. You did well. Looking for validation all around the room. <laughs> this is Nick Dawson from Talk House Film, and you've been listening to JC Chandor and Josh Mond on the Talk House Film podcast. This episode was engineered and edited by Elia Einhorn. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to Talkhouse Film and Talkhouse Music Podcasts on iTunes, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can.